Hey everyone, so today we're going to discuss the topic of ionization energy. Now, like any other topic, we're going to start with the basic definition of ionization energy, but before we go any further, we need to make sure that we have a good understanding of orbitals, quantum numbers, and ground state electron configurations. If you don't, or if you just need a little bit of a refresher, I do have some videos that you might find helpful. There's my video on orbitals and quantum numbers, my video on the shapes of atomic orbitals. I've got a video called, Why Does the Periodic Table Have Such a Funky Shape? Which is basically an introduction to ground state electron configurations. There's my video on electron configurations for multi-electron atoms. And my atomic radius video also has some pretty useful information that could come in handy as well. So click the corresponding thumbnail images if you're interested in watching any of these. So where were we? Oh yeah, the definition of ionization energy. The ionization energy of an atom is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from that atom in the gaseous state. For instance, suppose we successfully supplied enough energy to a lithium atom to remove its outermost electron. The resulting cation would have a charge of 1+. And this amount of energy would represent lithium's first ionization energy, which is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from a lithium atom for the first time. What if we wanted to remove a second electron from the lithium atom, resulting in a cation with a 2 plus charge? Well, this amount of energy would be called the second ionization energy of the atom. It's important to understand that the second ionization energy is not the amount of energy required to remove two electrons, but rather the amount of energy required to remove one electron after the first electron has already been removed. The value of lithium's first and second ionization energies are shown here. Notice that the second ionization energy is significantly larger than the first ionization energy, and we'll explain why a little bit later. Let's take a look at the first ionization energies for the first 54 elements in the periodic table. Notice the pattern. The first ionization energy generally tends to climb up slowly as the atomic number increases, starting with lithium and reaching a peak at neon. Then, all of a sudden, the first ionization energy drops dramatically at sodium, and the pattern repeats itself. So what does this look like on the periodic table? Well, remember how there was an upward climb in first ionization energy with increasing atomic number as you go from lithium to neon? Well, on the periodic table, that means going from left to right across the second period. In general, first ionization energy increases going from left to right across a period. What happens as we travel down a group of the periodic table? Well, if we take a look at the graph again, we can turn our attention to the noble gases and see that the higher atomic number noble gases, such as krypton and xenon, have much lower first ionization energies than the lower atomic number noble gases like helium and neon. So in general, first ionization energy decreases going down a group of the periodic table. So based on these trends, we're in a position where we can look at two elements and predict which one is going to have the higher first ionization energy out of the two, simply based on their relative positions in the periodic table. Now it's not going to work every time, and there are plenty of exceptions to this general trend, and if you like, I can upload a video where I discuss these exceptions in more detail. Um, but nevertheless, the general trend is a fairly handy tool to have in your chemistry tool belt. For instance, which of the following two elements, arsenic or fluorine, has a greater first ionization energy? Well, if we look at them on the periodic table, we'll see that fluorine has a higher first ionization energy than everything directly below it, since first ionization energy decreases as you go down a group. We also know that arsenic has a lower first ionization energy than everything directly to the right of it, since first ionization energy increases as you go from left to right across a period. Since fluorine is above and to the right of arsenic, it's fluorine that has the greater first ionization energy of the two. So why does first ionization energy generally increase going from left to right across a period? And why does it decrease going down a group of the periodic table? Well, let's think of ionization energy as like the energy that you would expend digging a root out of the ground. If a root is really stuck in the ground, then you're going to have to expend a lot of energy to get it out of the ground, right? And if a root is not stuck in the ground very much, or if it's just kind of sitting on the ground, then you're not going to have to expend nearly as much energy removing it. So we can think of a root as like an electron. So what I mean by that is when an electron is held in more tightly by the positively charged nucleus of an atom, it's going to be more difficult to remove, and more difficult means it requires more energy, so that means higher first ionization energy. Conversely, if the electron is not held in very tightly by that positively charged nucleus, well, that means that you're not going to have to expend a lot of energy to pull it out, and so that means a low first ionization energy. So again, more energy means more difficult. Less energy means less difficult to remove that electron. So with that in mind, I'm going to attempt 
to briefly explain the phenomena that give rise to these observed trends. My atomic radius video discusses these topics in much more thorough detail, so if you need a more thorough explanation, feel free to check that video out. So let's start with why the first ionization energy generally decreases as you go down a group of the periodic table. Well, with each step downward, the principal quantum number increases by one, which introduces a brand new principal energy level with orbitals that are progressively larger and progressively further away from the nucleus on average. So when your valence electrons start populating orbitals that are farther away on average from the nucleus, well, the electrons are further away. That means they're being held less tightly by that nucleus, which means that they're easier to remove. And if they're easier to remove, that means it's going to take less energy to remove them. So in general, as you go down a group, the first ionization energy tends to decrease. It gets easier to remove electrons that are further away from the nucleus. Okay, so why does first ionization energy generally increase going from left to right across a period? Well, with each step that you take to the right across a period of the periodic table, what you're really doing is you're adding another valence electron, but you're also adding another proton to that nucleus, which is, of course, positively charged. The valence electrons are shielded from the full positive charge of that nucleus by the core electrons, but valence electrons don't provide shielding to each other. They can only be shielded from the full effects of, the, of that positively charged nucleus by the core electrons. And so basically what happens is as you go from left to right, you're adding more protons, you're making your nucleus more positively charged, you're adding more valence electrons, but those extra valence electrons aren't really providing any additional shielding from the full effects of that positively charged nucleus. So in chemistry terms, what this means is that your effective nuclear charge, which is the charge that each electron feels, and it basically accounts for uh, any lack of charge that's due to shielding, your effective nuclear charge increases going from left to right. So with each step to the right, the valence electrons on average feel a stronger pull from that positively charged nucleus. And if there's a stronger pull from that nucleus, well, that means your electrons are being held in more tightly, which means they are more difficult to remove, which means it's going to take more energy. So again, going from left to right, effective nuclear charge increases, electrons are held in more tightly, and the first ionization energy becomes progressively higher. So I know I rushed very quickly through the concepts of shielding and effective nuclear charge, but again, if you need more clarification on these topics, please feel free to check out my atomic radius video. There's visuals, there's diagrams, and um, it'll explain it. <laughs> so what about second ionization energies and third ionization energies and so on and so forth? Well, let's go back to that example where we saw the first and second ionization energies of lithium. Why do you suppose that lithium's second ionization energy is so much higher than its first ionization energy? In other words, why is it so much more difficult to remove a second electron from a lithium atom than it is to remove the first electron from the lithium atom? Well, let's start by looking at lithium's ground state electron configuration, which is 1s2, 2s1. The first electron to be removed is the 2s electron. When the first electron is removed, the resulting lithium ion's electron configuration is 1s2, which is identical to that of helium. Noble gases like helium have particularly stable electron configurations because the overall energy of the electrons around the atom is lower when the outermost principal level is completely full. So removing a second electron from a lithium atom would mean removing an electron from a species with a stable noble gas electron configuration, which is difficult, and it takes a lot of energy. Those electrons really don't want to go anywhere. They're, they're happy where they're at. And so therefore, we get a huge jump between the first and second ionization energies of lithium. Let's compare this to, say, magnesium. Notice the gap between first and second ionization energies of magnesium is fairly small, but the gap between magnesium's second and third ionization energies is off the charts. There's a large gap between the second and third ionization energies of magnesium for the same reason that there's a large gap between first and second ionization energies of lithium. Magnesium achieves a noble gas electron configuration after two electrons have been removed. And so removing the third one is the particularly difficult step that requires a lot of energy. So that is all for now. I hope you found this video helpful and I can't wait to see you next time. Have a good one.